Michael and Seconds Virtual Seminars. The seminar you're watching today is E2VE form handling. This is a special type of residential valuation tied typically um, for the purposes of this class to dwellings that are at farm properties or farm type properties. You could also encounter this in a non-farming type situation. Um, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to be focusing more on the um, you know, farm type properties with outbuildings, things like that, but only the dwelling part of it. So we're going to look at the dwellings tied to farms. This, this, this account that generally is being impacted by this is Western Reserve Group. So if you're an inspector watching this, you probably are servicing Western Reserve Group as your um, is one of the accounts you're being handling. So we're going to look at E2VE form handling and how to fill those out properly. And I'll take the pictures and the sketch that you're doing and put it all together in the valuation. The E2VE form is different than other types of valuation in the way that it computes. And I have to like break down how we get to get there and so on from there. Um, every Western Reserve inspection you receive that is, has a farm fire or um, is just a straight up dwelling survey with an E2VE attached will have a support document in the deck pages. This the document you're seeing on screen now is going to be that a part of that document sent to you. Um, within the document we're looking at today, we're going to break out some other pieces of it today. But uh, I'm going to kind of go down and look at the now, Giza site now, and we'll look at the form live. So we're going to go into the live site here. And we have the E2VE form up um, inside a train ticket here. And we're going to look at the this form is very empty. There's not a lot of stuff for you to, it's not checkbox, clickbox. You're going to put a lot of inputs in here. So you're taking the basic um, footprint of your diagram and all the various aspects of that sketch and putting the, the uh, parameters in. We're going to look at our first um, set of pictures and explain how this kind of works. So I'm going to pull up a uh, report with some photos and a sample diagram. We're going to take a look at how you put this thing together. All right, so we have a typical farm type dwelling that you'd find anywhere in, you know, rural America. And uh, we're going to take a look at the various photos here. So we got the front photo here, pretty much straight up rectangular, uh, two story farmhouse type look with a front, uh, the open porch there. Uh, that's the front view. Left side view, you can kind of see the differences in story heights, uh, different things going on here, identify the roof, foundations, things like that. Rear corner photo, so rear right, or rear left corner, I guess. Um, you've got the, again, the story heights identified, roof identified, and what's going on with story heights. And then the true rear, looking at the back side of the property towards the street side. So um, you got to kind of get a feel in your mind what this diagram may ultimately look like. Okay. Now we're going to pull up the sketch here in a second once we get past the right side photo here. And then we have the actual, what the footprint of this diagram actually looks like. Now this, for the purposes of my class, we are going to show you a, a more detailed sketch than like the satellite view would be. But um, you're going to be doing the same types of computations with the satellite view as well. If you're using a satellite view diagram or if you're using the actual physical inspections, here's uh, the apex sketching as well. But for the purposes of this example, the examples we're doing today, we're going to do this, this type of format so I can very clearly break down this house and how we're going to go about putting it together. Okay. Um, the first thing about E2 value inspections, as you are looking at the square footage of the of the home as a whole, as your data point. So you're not going to be doing, um, you can break out additions. So if parts of the house were additions, you can break those out separately. But for the purpose, if the original home, if all the square footage above grade is all the original construction year, we're going to put those square footages all together. So real quickly, just you know, pretty easily, we have a one-story crawl space in the back half of the building, basically at 482 square feet. The core front of the house is the original, the, the main farmhouse section is two-story basement at 1,064. We're adding those two square footages together to get the living area for the first input here. So it has. Square footage of living area, main living area. Main living area is everything combined if there's no addition. 
There's an exception to this. I'm going to show an, an example a little bit as well. But for what we're doing right now, example number one, gross square footage above grade. In this dwelling, it's 1,546 square feet. I'm not going to show a calculator how I got that. We kind of showed the footprint there. We're going to say this house was built in 1930. So you're putting a square footage in with a year with that square footage. So you're identifying sections as we go through. Additionally, we're breaking out foundations here. So if you're taking a look at your footprint here, we have a basement. The basement level on this house is obviously half of two story because it's only one level. So it'd be 532 square feet on the basement level in this dwelling. So additional living area type, we are covering above grade and below grade areas for this valuation. It's a very different than other types of valuations we do. So we're accounting for the, the, the basement level. In this case, we're going to say the basement is unfinished. You have multiple other options in here if you happen to get access or can, as part of your interview, you knew it was finished or not. Or in this case, we're going unfinished. In the basement square footage, I said was 532 square feet. Again, built the same year as the main of the home, obviously. And then we're breaking down the diagram further. The next area that we have to account for in this case below grade is the crawl space in the back half of the house in this case we have a one-story crawl that crawl space square footage is 482 square feet if i go back living additional living area the, the the crawl space the basement all these things have dollar values got to put them in there because they are part of the replacement cost so crawl space Crawl space in this example is 482 square feet, built in 1930, okay? The remaining portion above grade is our open porch that you saw on the front of the home originally on that first photo. So we have an open porch, 176 square feet, okay? So living area, again, if it's a got a replacement value, if the house burnt down, whatever, there is a value to this thing. Open porch, at 176 square feet, built in 1930, okay? I took all of the pieces of this sketch and just applied them. Everything in this sketch has been applied to that, that, that uh, valuation component. So we've got everything on this sketch applied. So we run the replacement cost and review, we'll get a dollar value spit out. All right, scrolling down. I'm going to collapse this section down. Not scrolling a bunch. Now, you're get, the next aspect of the E2VE form is applying the structure's pro, a, a profile of the structure. What does this mean? Okay, some parameters that impact the replacement cost could be where it's located. So, for example, it's got an option there, description of a locale. I hit the drop-down list here with a bunch of unique types of settings that a dwelling could exist in. You could live on a beachfront, be in a coastal area, in a gated community, in a remote area like in the mountains of West Virginia or something. A rural area, which for our purposes today is going to be the dominant option a suburban area, urban areas, and so on. But for our purposes today, doing farm type properties, the, the locale we're using is rural. And again, for other types of surveys you could be doing, this may not apply. It could be a different option you use if you're not doing farm type properties. So rural. Now we get into architectural style. You may have not been exposed to this prior, um, with other types of valuations where you're identifying a type of structure you're dealing with. But for our purposes, these there's a, a style listing where you are assigning the style of this dwelling. At certain construction styles have a certain dollar per square foot averaging done with them based on what they are. Um, to assist the inspector in identifying this component, we do have a cheat guide
that goes through all of the residential home classifications with sample photos and descriptions on each type of style that's available to you. So if you're not sure if you're choosing the correct style or not, you could go through 15 or 20 pages here of different example photos with definitions to find the best fit for your building. So if you're not sure, you can go in and kind of find that, okay? For our example, I'm calling this dwelling a farmhouse. I'm gonna scroll, get to that title here. And then we'll see what the description is. You can kind of see how I got there if I was going from zero, okay? So in our example dwelling, this is not a perfect match exactly, but it looks pretty basic. Sight lines, roof lines, windows. It looks very similar to what we're, kind of in the general realm of what we're doing right now. So farmhouse, okay? Um, and if you want to, you know, flesh out a little further, you could look into other definitions to see if it's a better fit for you out of the options given. But for, like I said before, most inspections we're doing in a farm type setting are gonna be an older home, probably a hundred years old or more, where unless it's a brand new, you know, you know very expensive home that add to an existing farm property. You're, if it's an older property, you're probably gonna have dealing with an older farmhouse, a hundred years old or more. So that's the example of the style I'm gonna give here. So our architectural style, as like I said before, we're gonna go with farmhouse. Construction type. Construction type is gonna be your way of identifying what is, how, what is the structure of this building? What is it made up of? How is it constructed? Most farmhouses that we're dealing with <coughs> are gonna be a wood frame. So wood framing. If you had like a masonry building, uh, stucco building, whatever, brick veneer structure, whatever it may be, you could adjust this. But for most farmhouses, you're dealing with a wood frame structure. Construction quality. Hit the drop down list. You're able to artificially increase the replacement, like depreciation on this building by inputting in a, a whatever construction quality you'd like this to be. Is this an average farmhouse? Is it above average? Is it better than the average farmhouse? Is it is it one of a kind? What how, what kind of um, how does this thing this building kind of fall if you were taking a sampling of a hundred farmhouses? What it would look like compared to others? Um, most inspections we do are going to be an average standard quality at the time that house was built. It was built under typical recognized construction methods of an average measure. It's not above average, it's not below average, just an average construction of what you'd expect for that time period. Okay. Another aspect that can re impact replacement costs on a structure is going to be the physical shape of your building. Okay. Most people don't really think about this, but the more ins and outs, jut ins, jut outs, angles, things you've got going on does impact the replacement cost of the structure in question. So you've got to kind of take this into account when you're doing this. I'm going to hit the drop down list here. It's got a bunch of different descriptions of what the shape of this building is. If you're looking at the building from the sky in a satellite view in a helicopter, you're flying it over and over it in a, you know, a uh, single pass or plane or something, you know, crop dust or whatever, what would this thing look like from the sky? So what's the layout? Now, if you remember our diagram from a little bit ago, um, it's got a very dis distinctive shape, okay? It looks like a letter, a backwards letter L. So it's, it would be, for construction methodology, this will be considered an L-shaped building, okay? So for shape, we're able to assign a shape to it. Now there are a lot of other shapes in there. L shape would be one where you're obviously got an L shape to it. Rectangular, pretty obvious. Rectangular with an angled wing would be where you've got like a, a generally rectangular structure with a jut out like on a single 45 degree angle wall somehow. Um, square, T shape, looking down at the sky, it's gonna, it looks like a letter T or a U and so on. One interesting per item to know about identifying a shape, a shape 
is defined not including an attached garage. So if your if your structure is actually rectangular and there's an attached garage on the front left corner that makes it an L shape, if the the attached garage was not there, it's truly a rectangular building. So be very aware of this. Um, if garages don't factor into the shape you identify with. The exception with garages would be if you had a built-in garage on an upper level where there's physically living space above that garage, then it is part of the defined shape. But just understand that's a big exclusion or big adjustment for people because you're not going to think that way normally. From the sky, if there's a garage is attached and it makes it an L shape or a Whatever, a T shape, even part of it, it would be an L, but it made it a T by throwing an attached garage on it. Remove the attached garage. What's the shape? For our example here, we're not dealing with the garage. I'm just making the point so you're understanding that concept for the future because we may encounter it later today. L shape. Number of stories. What's the dominant number of stories on this structure? The single largest story height in this building is two stories. Okay. Then you're assigning the, the mater wall material. Wall materials are defined in this valuation by primary and secondary. Primary is the majority of the exterior of the walls are what? And then if there's any secondary material noted, maybe the, the majority of the home is vinyl siding and they have a small section by the front porch that's brick veneer. You can split out primary and secondary that way. If you do not have a secondary material, you just enter the original material again. So in review, they remove that secondary material, but for your purposes, we don't wanna leave Adobe kind of hanging out there as a secondary material and have it go in there as an accident. So from our purposes, we're just gonna put um, vinyl siding here for our dwelling here. And then we don't wanna leave Adobe kind of hanging out because if we actually, if a reviewer or somebody missed it, we put it through to the client, there's gonna be some dollar value assigned to Adobe on this house that's not actually there. So we look kind of silly. If the client looks at it, we look like egg in our face. So it's better just to double dip. If we remove the second vinyl siding off this, so it's not a double dip valuation, but um, review will catch it and remove the second one on there. You don't have a way to remove the second choice. It's just there. Um, so just if it's no secondary roof, no secondary material, just double dip it and put it the second choice in there. Review fixes it. Another interesting parameter to look, think about on the, the structure profile, um, has the home been renovated in the last 20 years? Now, within the last 20 years, it's pretty obvious, but the definition of renovated will vary greatly in some people's minds, okay? Renovated does not mean HGTV. We renovate a bathroom, kitchen to add value to the home, to resell it or something, to flip it or flip this house or something. That's not what this is. Renovations for us, for this valuation, means gutting this thing down to the stud walls. We're not renovating, renovating a kitchen. We're not renovating a bathroom or something like that. We're physically gutting the interior down to the stud walls and then rewiring it re-drywalling it and then finishing the rooms off, laying it, change the layouts, whatever, but it's physically being gutted. You would have to know this in an interview with an insured to get this to be an answered yes. Um, a lot of the valuations we do um, are uh, or on dwelling surveys where there's no contact with an insured. So you're not gonna have an interview here. If it was a farm inspection that you're looking at outbuildings and stuff it's, and it's part of the, uh, the appointment making process, you could get this in the appointment making, you know, as part of the phone call or interview. But a lot of this, these types of surveys could be ordered with exterior only access. So kind of be careful with that. Has the home been renovated? In this case, we're putting no. And then primary and secondary roof materials. Same thing here again. You have a listing of roofs here, roofing materials here. I'm not going to go through them chapter and verse. Hopefully you have a general understanding of different types of roofs. Um, again, we're dealing, this is dealing with farm properties. So you're going to have a very limited scope of types of roofs that are available to you. Okay. Um, if you're in a more higher end area or something like that, you may have in, you know, a, a sub, sub, 
suburban development or something may have different types of roofs. But for what we're doing today, we're focusing on, on agricultural farm type property. So very common uh, selections for shingles on buildings. Um, you could have architectural shingles, which is that three-dimensional, higher end, heavier duty shingle. Asbestos looks like a fish eye or like a diamond shaped shingle that are very, you know, very, very old. Asphalt is pretty common for a lot of dwellings in a farm type property. Another one we typically deal with with steel roofs is metal other than standing seam. Standing seam is a higher end replacement cost. So a general, a general metal roof, like tin roof, stuff like that would be fall under metal. Metal other than standing seam, which is kind of a catch all definition for steel roofs. We're going to throw this option on this house we're doing now. If you had a secondary roof available, maybe the home had an addition or something, you could split out the primary roof finish and the secondary roof material to adjust for dollar values. In this case, again, we don't have a, a, a secondary roof material. So we're going to double, we're going to enter metal again in the review department again, it removes that second selection when they actually compute this thing out. Okay. Um, roof configuration. We are going under the understanding that you may know what some of these things are. I'll explain a couple of them in the samples here, but not all of them. So you can very quickly Google or Yahoo search some of these definitions and kind of figure it out quickly with screenshots. We do have help documents in the library as well that do go over configurations. We can look at some of the red, the personal lines manuals. It does go over some of the stuff in there, but um, we've got some typical um, roofing configurations that fall here. For our example today, let me go back to our pictures here. We have a very dominant style of roof um, configuration. The style of roof configuration you're seeing here, which is very, very applicable to farm type homes, is a gable roof. It's a single triangular um, pitch, usually at a 45 degree angle, very, very basic. No shoulders, no build out, it's just a straight up one directional roof generally. Um, and you've got, you can see gable roofs all across the board here on the back part, on the front part, it's all that straight up 45 degree angle and one, you know, you've got a, a north and a south roof covering and that's it. There's no other shoulders building off that to add value to the home. That's going to be a gable roof. I'll show some other examples today as we're going through our, our video here. But for our purposes today, that example is a gable roof. Okay. What type of roof pitch are you throwing on the home? You have four different selections here. Flat roof. Usually the distinction we make for a flat roof pitch is zero to 15 degrees. So if the roof pitch is zero to 15 degrees, we consider it flat. A slight roof pitch is about 15 degrees to 30 degrees. So if you have a 15 degree to approximate 30 degree roof, put it as slight. Moderate is kind of a catch all, 30 degrees, and then usually averaging around 45. And then steep roof would be about 60 degrees or greater. So if you get that moderate, the nice neat 45 degree is the moderate option, which is gonna be our selection today. And then roof age, you are putting a year or a, a, a physical number value in here. What do you feel the roof age is? If you made a contact with the insured or for your appointment, this is the question you want to address with them as part of your interview or the phone interview to, in person or on the phone to get this knocked out. Um, if you don't have an age supplied, we can't put unknown in here. You've got to throw a best estimate on here if you don't know. If a lot of steel roofs or metal roofs are original to the home, they can be 50, 60 years or more. Um, in this example, I'm just gonna throw 30 years on here just for argument's sake. But just know you can have steel roofs that go much, much longer in age. Asphalt shingled roofs, usually when you get to 25 years are gonna be near failure, depending on the, the amount of sun exposure and such on asphalt roofs. So just you're not going to see a 45 year or 50 year old asphalt roof generally. If you do, it's going to show a drastic amount of wear on it. 
In our case, again, we're dealing with steel though or metal, so metal ages can vary greatly. So I'm gonna put 30 on here on this one because it's not super, super old. It looks a little newer than, you know, nine, you know, 100 years old roughly. But um, you're also assigning a structure profile. What is the foundation type? If you're walking around the perimeter of the building, what is the foundation look like? If you hit the drop down list, what is this type of this building sitting on? So concrete block is very commonplace when you have buildings or crawl spaces. In older you know, farm homes, you could have field stone or stone rubble. Um, field stone is common or stone rubble, whatever. Poured concrete is going to be more of a, a you know, 40 years or newer type setup probably. Um, so for our example here, we can see that the front porch here. Um, that, that older style 1940s or 1930s brick. So we're gonna say concrete block, I'm sorry, concrete block here, not brick. And then slope of the site. Does the building, does the property slope from front to back, left to right? Is there a slope to it where you're gonna have more of the building exposed than not? For our example here, it is a flat slope. It looks pretty straight. If you were to try to mow the lawn or something, it's going. It's a pretty easy job for you to do. So nothing crazy. No, not a lot of ups and downs and grade changes, whatever. Another area that you could be applying value to for replacement costs this is more for the depreciation or actual cash value. These are subjective measures, so kind of be careful. But what's your general first, if you were driving by this building in a real quick examination, what do you think the general condition is? Your first impression is the number of what they want here. What's your first impression? Is it good shape, average, poor, what is it? It's a pretty typical average farmhouse to me. So we'll say average. What's the roof look like? Is the roof a better than average shape, worse than average? That metal roof looked pretty good, so I'm gonna put it in you know good shape for the roof. Foundation, the foundation that you went into the perimeter walk around, what'd you feel it was? Good shape, bad shape, what was it? I'll say average here. And then exterior wall condition. Now on this one, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna get that back, sorry, um, go back to here. All right, we did have some wear noted in the back of the building. Could be mold, mildew, or could this be condition related. Uh, it's not bad shape, but it's, it's, get, it's got some fair condition on the walls. And then a big depreciation weight on the replacement cost is the structure actually in use. If the building is not in use and it's vacant and the, the utilities are turned off, whatever, the building's just sitting, taking the elements, that will put an arbitrary um, weight on the depreciation. So it is better to have a building in use than not. It's not in use. You put no on there, it does come back with a lower replacement cost because of it for depreciation. In this case, we'll put yes. And the last area here, types of windows. We are not requiring you to be experts on windows. You could very easily Google or Yahoo or search out different styles of windows. But for our purposes, Gonna go back to our photos here. And what types of windows are on this thing? We've got pretty much single hung windows across the front and upstairs where it's just, you open the window with a latch, you slide it up. That's a single hung window. Um, on the side here, it's all the same types of windows. Just open the lock or seal, open it up, and you got you can slide the window up. It's a single hung window. Across all these windows are single hung. Um, we have other examples today. I will talk about those as we go through them. But we do have a single hung window on for the perimeter here. Standard window brands, nothing crazy there. Is there in it? Is there a chimney on the structure? You can see on that back of the building there is a concrete block masonry chimney on the back of the one story section. Doesn't go the full length. They had it looks like some of the trim there had been chipped off or removed. Maybe, maybe it's diminished or took a piece of it off or something, who knows. 
but there is a one chimney on the south. So one chimney that is masonry construction. You can see it's a block constructed chimney here. Okay, that is example number one for what we're doing today. Okay, we're gonna go back in and do example two here in a second. I'm gonna clear out some of these answers here and just make it better for me go into this clean here, or a little closer clean anyway. And we're gonna look at example number two. Okay, bear with me for a second here. All right, example number two, we have a more modern, you know, age dwelling. Still on a farm property, you can see some farm build, it's fenced off partially as a farm building in the back. Um, so we've got some farm stuff going on, but it's a much, a much newer development where it's, this building is placed. Um, one story building, you can notice there's a, a lower level garage here. Rear side of the building, got a really large mature tree across the back there. We can't clearly see the layout of the building here, but we got the fence there plus some tree covers. So we can't see perfect. Opposite corner, we can see pretty good here. You've got a rear section of the building that's elevated on piers. You can see where the bottom level is completely open on that back jut out. And then we have a pretty decent size uh, deck across the back there. From the street side, when they're pulling up, you can see it's a pretty good distance away, but you can see at the bottom level of that rear section is completely open. So it is freestanding on piers on that rear section. Okay. And then going to look at a diagram quickly here. This is what the diagram would look like and the shape of this building would look like from the sky. So we're giving a footprint of the building here. Uh, we chose this building as an example today because a lot of different factors in play here. Um, <clears throat> the first factor in play is we have a basement foundation and we have a pier, a section of the building on piers. How do we account for these things in the report? Okay. First thing we're gonna say is this building was built in 1988. And we're gonna say the entire building, the one story basement and the piers section were built at the same time. So one story piers and one story basement were built both in 1988. Okay, I took a calculator and added up those two square footages we would be at 2,160 square feet. So 2,160 square feet built in 1988. We have additional living spaces. So we're breaking out. We, I told you before, we do above, above grade living space, below grade does a replacement cost. So in this case, we have a pretty good sized basement. But the basement here has a caveat, as we showed before. Um, let me get this out of here, sorry. We've got a basement level garage. So we have a basement and a section of the basement is basement level garage. How am I gonna account for this distinction? So they have different dollar values. We know the one story basement square footage is 1,680 square feet. We know the basement garage is 576 square feet of the 1,680. So we could very quickly make an adjustment here for data points to make this work. Okay. So our basement level garage, hit the drop down list. We have some garage options in here. The basement garage, 576 built in 1988. The remaining garage, we 
we have to define what type, or I'm sorry, remaining basement we have to define. That entire lower level behind that, before you get to the piers, is that whole back of that one-story one basement is completely open. You can walk out the basement to that pier underneath that piers level. You can walk out the back of the house. So our basement level on the dwelling is a walkout basement. So we have some basement options here. We have basement finished walkout, basement partially finished walkout, and then unfinished walkout. For my example, I'm just gonna go unfinished walkout. I don't know if it's finished or not. We didn't get in, we didn't view it. We don't have photos to confirm or not. So I'm just going to say unfinished walkout. 1,104 square feet is what the leftover basement is after you move my garage, my basement garage. So the basement garage plus the unfinished walkout basement, those two areas together are 1,680 square feet, which based on our diagram is the square footage of basement space on this dwelling. Okay, then we're breaking up the rest of the house here. We have an open porch and a deck left over here. I'm gonna do my open porch next. I have an open porch across the front of the building. It's 192 square feet, built in 1988. And then we have a wood deck on the back here also. Um, 256 at 1988. Um, that deck is larger than it shows in the picture. We do have a 16 by 16 that kind of builds down to a, a, a above ground pool. We're not going to be measuring decks around pools. Um, if you had a larger step down deck or something, you could approximate it, but we do not want you spending extra time trying to get cute cutting out a pool, especially like a, a, an above ground round pool trying to measure the ins and outs and all those crooks to try to get that deck square footage perfect. You could approximate it and remove the, the deck, the uh, pool square footage to get a, a more true deck measurement. But for our purposes, we don't want you to spend these extra time unnecessarily. So I'm gonna put the 256 in, which I already did for my deck here, and we're moving along, okay? So that's our data inputs for the areas on this dwelling. We're doing the same exact thing as we did before. Structure profile. This building is located in a rural area. So we put rural as our option for locale. What type of style is this dwelling? Okay, if you've done this for a little while, you've probably heard the term ranch thrown around from time to time. This is a basic one story dwelling on a basement. So it is a ranch style dwelling here. This time around, is it still a wood frame structure or not? Um, from my perspective and the photos we saw, I would say yes. It's average condition for what you'd expect to find. If you had a bunch of ranches collectively, it's not above them or below them, it's typical. And then what's the shape of the dwelling? Again, we have a one-story basement with a one-story on piers. So if you were drawing the layout, you do have a little bump out in the front with some additional angles, but the core building is still probably an L shape. You could call it unique as well, because you have some that build out in the front left corner with that porch, but it's not a lot extra money to try and put this together. So I probably would go with an L shape as my choice here. Um, so L shape, it's not rectangular, it's not a T shape, it's not a U shape, um, it's not really unique. You need to have a lot more ins and outs, a lot more stuff going on. So I would consider this to be an L shaped dwelling still. Number of stories this time around, this is a one story dwelling on a basement. What's our wall materials? The majority of the exterior of this building is actually wood siding. It's very pronounced within the um, within the photos at the rear of the building here. You can see it's very clearly wood siding on that one story pier section as well as that same siding layout on that above the garage there. 
So wood siding there, you may not be able to tell, but in the left the area left of the open porch, there is brick veneer on that house. So if you follow the staircase up there, the stairs up there, there is brick veneer on the front of that house. So wood siding is the primary exterior. Secondary exterior, we have brick veneer. They put they have two different types of brick veneer in here. A typical brick veneer is a common brick veneer nothing crazy you can you have more advanced or more high dollar brick veneer but for us it's common brick veneer has the house been gutted the last 20 years no this time around what's our roofing material we saw asphalt shingles in the photo here we were looking at it an examination i'm not going to go back and forth on pictures here the roof pitches on this again were just like the farmhouse earlier You've got gable roofs all over the place on this thing. So pretty much typical pitch, 45 degree, nothing crazy. Gable is the configuration. A moderate pitch is 45 degrees normally. Um, this house we said was built 1988. So the house roof would be 35 years old on asphalt. Probably not that old. I would put like, we'll put eight years in this example here. And then moving down here. What's the foundation on this building, okay? Um, with the walkout here, we don't have a good perspective here. We see some brick veneer on that, behind that garage. Um, we really can't tell on the other corner what that is gonna be on there. Um, it's probably gonna be block or poured concrete. Um, I can't confirm it. Poured concrete is more money than concrete block. I'm gonna go with concrete block because you can't confirm it's poured or not. And then slope of the site this time around is definitely noted. Because look at the front driveway, look at the front porch. You definitely have a hillside slope on this house. So a slope here, I would probably consider a slight or moderate. It's pretty pretty good. If you're mowing this, you definitely would go down to moderate pace. I'm gonna put a moderate slope on this for my site. General condition across the board on this house, I feel is good. So general condition is good, the roof is good. It's only eight years we estimated. Foundation's good, wall condition's good. Is it property in use? We'll say yes. And then we're looking for window styles and chimney. So back to my photos here. Um, we have on the front, by the, the left of the porch there, we've got single hung windows in all likelihood on that brick veneer section. Above the garage, we have some windows there. Um, those could be fixed windows. They could also be casement windows. If you're not familiar with the term of casement, a casement window is a window where you unlock it and you're able to crank it with like a hand crank to have the window open. Other photos or building pictures, windows here. We've got a lot of single hungs here. Nothing kind of crazy. A lot of single hung windows all around here. So um, I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna call the windows above the garage fixed. They could be casement pretty easy, but we'll call them fixed here. Um, we'll say single hung windows as well as a fixed windows above the garage standard window brands. And then do we have chimneys on this house? Go back to our examination. Do you see a chimney on the house? Back to the first photo, you should see one above that star on the garage level. Above that, you see a chimney in the center there. There's at least one chimney on this house that we see in the photos supplied. So it's a, one chimney and it's masonry. You can see brick on it. If, if you look at the photo, it's kind of hard with this, so you could zoom in and see it there. We've got our photo there. And that would be the way to fill out the E2VE form for that dwelling. We had a couple different elements in play there. We had to break out our basement, had to account for some different data points in the form that were not found prior with the hillside in a walkout basement and some other things kind of going on, okay? We'll just kind of get these cleaned up quick here and then we'll move on to our last example for the class today. And then if you have questions, um, 
You can always consult your manager after the fact on this or look at some support documents that we supply that you can look at that will give you some more information to consider. Again, any of the options on the forms, if you're not familiar with what they are, you can very quickly online search it and look it up as well. Um, we're going to go to exa our third example today. Okay. Now, our third example does not have as many photos available. So I want to make this a little harder to put this together for us um, because it's not always nice and neat. Oh, we all four corners. It's all perfect. There's no tree cover. The last one had a fence in the way and some trees in the way, so it wasn't perfect to look at. But this one, we don't have as many photos. Um, an older home here, basic two-story dwelling, got a good, a decent-sized wraparound open porch on the front of the house. Next photo is the rear side of the house. This home builds backwards. So it starts, you got a two-story section in the front of the house, a one-and-a-half-story section in the middle of the house, and then the back is a one story, and then it builds back to even an enclosed porch. So you've got a lot of different things in play on this house, breaking this house apart. And then we have the right side of the house to show more of the ins and outs and stuff like that. Um, so again, two story house with a good size wraparound porch in the front. Hopefully you've made some other observations mentally as you're looking at these pictures. And then we're going to look at what the sketch looks like. Now, we're, we have a detailed sketch here. If you did the satellite view or looking down on a, of a helicopter or a crop duster or whatever, you're able to see the pretty good layout of the building here. Um, this building has a two-story section, a one-and-a-half-story section, and a one-story section. So three different story heights in play. Using the rules we did earlier, you might think this is a pretty easy house to put together. But we're going to change it up a little bit for our example because I want you to earn your time today with me. All right. Everything south, south of the blue line was built in 1918. Everything north of the blue line was built in 1945. Okay, so everything south of 1918, everything north of 1945. All right, um, taking that information into account, you might be tempted to take your calculator and want to start calculating information out. One thing we did not show you yet, when you do your living areas or you're trying to get your total square footages, you've got this half story kind of hanging out here. One and a half, so you have a half story hanging out. What am I doing with that half story? Okay, so our original 1918 square footage is we have 1966 was our this two story section, and we have that one and a half story section. Okay, the half story gets split out in its own area. So you've got to be kind of careful with this, it gets split out on its own area. Okay, so the area that's not a half story is 312 square feet. How did I get that? So we had 468 divided by 1.5 is 312. So our square footage for our main original constructed 1918 home section is going to be 1966 plus 312. Okay. We're going to get rid of my ink mark up here. We're going to put this in. So 1966 plus 312 is going to be 2278. Built 1918. We have a half story in our drop down list of options here. Bunch of options in here. One of them is a half story. Our half story from the math I just did was 156. 
we had 468 minus 312 gets us 160. I'm sorry, 166. I'm sorry. 166 built in 1918. And then we're taking the remainder of the sketch and breaking it up. So we've got our, we took our one and a half story. We've got to get our basement on here entered. So 1966 divided by two is a 1980, or I'm sorry, 983. So we have an unfinished basement. 983 built 1918. We also have in our sketch for taking pieces apart. So I've got to get, I got rid of this guy. Okay, we got this crawl space from 1918 still hanging out. So what's the square footage of the crawl space? Okay, it's not 468. It's actually 312. Because at grade or what's the square footage below grade is without the half story included. So 312 is going to be our crawl space square footage. Crawl space is included now. Okay. Now, the back of our, well, before I do that, let's do the open porch here. We got this open porch kind of hanging out still. 266 is the original porch from 1918 looks the part looks the age we have an open porch it's 1918 and then we're taking we're just taking the sketch apart so i've got this guy accounted for this guy accounted for and this guy accounted for we're left with a one-story crawl and an enclosed porch. Okay. We said the rear section was built in 1945. So one-story crawl at 208. And so we have in this drop-down list, we have not added an addition yet. Within the listing here, you have an option for living area. Living area is your choice to make for additions on a home. So our addition was 208 square feet, built 1945, okay? Now we're left with a quandary. My form only has one more set of questions I can answer for living space, but I have two selections left on my diagram. I have the crawl space to account for, or my one story crawl, or I have the enclosed porch in the back. Okay. You you want to stick with living space, which in this case or in this case the crawl space would have more value to for us, and then the enclosed porch. So crawl space again, 208, this time built 1945. Then the question might be, okay, well, what happens with that enclosed porch? We just leave it off. No, you you only have so many sections on the form you can do for you internally. On the review side, the reviewer that has this case would add the enclosed porch for you. So we just we just don't give you that many selections in the form because generally the E2 value properties your E2VE form you know, reports you're doing are not going to be more than this many options. I use this example on purpose. To show you could have it happen where you have more options than you can input. So just know that could occur and we're able to take account for it. Again, locale, because we're dealing with farm properties, that's the focus of this class. The locale is going to be rural again. This is not always the case, obviously, across the United States for all properties that are ordered with E2VE form. But for our purposes of this presentation, rules the option we're using for locale architectural style again what's a good fit for my home in question here it does have a definitive style we use here i'm going to go back to our cheat document and you can scroll through the various options here to get one that fits you uh, 
Um, the option that we're going to use today is going to be Victorian for our example here. There is another more detailed definition of this house than this, but for the options available to me on the E2BE form, Victorian is the style we're going to use today. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to our report form here. So they have options in here. If you want to see the cheat document, we can supply to you. You can go through and find the best fit here. For our example today, it's going to be Victorian. What kind of construction is the home? You're going to say, see, seem to fall with the same ones over and over and over. Again, this is going to be wood framing. is going to be our style today. What quality is this house? Again, good, better, boss. Is it better than average? Is it a one of a kind home? What is it? This looks pretty standard fare for what we've seen anywhere really out in the country. So we're gonna say average again. What's the shape of the dwelling? Again, if you're looking at a helicopter, looking down on the property, what do you think the shape of the building is? For our purposes, this falls pretty easily on like a rectangle. It's not perfectly rectangular, but it's pretty close. The jut juts in, jut in and outs are only like three feet, so nothing crazy really. Um, so it's gonna fall under rectangular here. And then how many stories is the average story here or the main story here? Two stories. What's the exterior wall materials on this dwelling? We'll just go with vinyl siding here. And again, you double, you enter it twice because we, unless we have more than one, more than one material, you enter it twice. Was this home renovated, which for us means gutted? If it was not gutted, you didn't do an interview, you didn't do an interview, you don't know, you've got to go with no. Unless you truly know it was gutted, we're not going online to look up building permits and stuff, but if you talk to an insured as part of your interview, doing farm buildings, whatever, they tell you they gutted it, cool, and you put yes. But for our purposes here, the answer is no. Looking at roof material, just doing this for argument's sake to get us to look at it. Does You can't really tell with the zoom because it'll pixelate out, but is this a typical architect? asphalt roof on this home uh, if we had roof photos zoomed up closer this is not a typical asphalt roof it's a higher end roof for for shingles on here which would be architectural shingles they're higher higher dollar higher quality shingle that's on this roof architectural shingles the one in play here this time around our dwelling is not a nice neat cookie cutter gable roof so i look at the roof photo here or our roof configurations here. We have a couple different things going on. We've got a gable roof to the left of the porch. We have a hip roof, which we've not seen before in our three examples, um, where you've got a shoulder that's very, very pronounced going in a different direction than what you've seen prior. It's got a, a, a three-dimensional shoulder almost on that, or that it meets a chimney in the center. Right side of the house is again gable, rear of the home, Again, you can see in the distance where that um, the roof the, the roof sections kind of meet to a point at the center where that chimney is. That's still a gay, a hip roof where it kind of goes like a pyramid shape almost with some additional gable sections here. That little one-story section off of that second chimney is a shed roof. It's a one a one angled section only. Going back to our porch. So you have a bunch of different roof types in play here using our configuration definitions here. We don't have a great fit on some of these. I would go with multi-level contemporary, even though this is an older home. Um, you don't, when they say dormers, you might say hip with gable dormers. These the, the gable sections on this roof are not dormers. A dormer is like a little bump out window, a little bump, like a half story bump out like an attic would have or something. This is not that. This is truly a much more built out gable sections here. So it's going to be multi-level here. That's the mo most exact definition we can do here. Roof pitches across the board. Most of the pitches on we've saw are 45 degrees. What's our roof age? 
Um, it's pretty good shape. We can't really see it kind of pixelate out our samples here. I'll say 10 years on this one, even though we don't have zoomed in pictures here to show it. If we did, we'd probably see it's probably not really old. What's the foundation type of this building? We have a crawl space and basement on this dwelling. Can we see there's a lot of shrubs and bushes around here? We really can't see up close what's going on. I'm just going to say brick concrete block here because we can't see it. Could be brick. We can't see it though. And then slope of the site this time around, we're not dealing with hillsides or something that, like that with the flat slope. General conditions of the home. In my impressions, looking around the building, it looked pretty good. Good general condition, good foundation or good roof. Probably an average foundation. We can't see because a lot of um, bush cover, whatever. We we can't examine it. We can't really rate it. We can't examine it. The exterior walls look pretty good. Is the house in use? We'll say yes. And then what type of windows are here? I'm going to go back to our pictures again. What do you see? Okay, again, we've got those double hung windows looks like, or single hung windows looks like here. We've got like a attic type window in the upper where the tree kind of absconds that we can't see it there. Um, back of the building, got our, again, single hung windows. You might have like a, a, a casement window on that attic dormer up there. We can't see perfect. Looks like it just pops out. It could be a, a, you know, it's not a fixed window there. It's probably a crank out type style or just a single hung. Um, we're going to go with single hung in this example. We can't really say for sure. Window brand standard. How many chimneys do you remember seeing in the photos? I remember two. We had one at the main point where that like almost pyramid shape came to a point with that hip shoulder. Those hip shoulders met in the converge in the center. And then we had another a chimney across the back of the building there on that one and a half story section. So we had two stories or two chimneys with that were masonry construction. They were brick. Okay. Um, that's going to be pretty much the ins and outs of a, a couple sample E2VE farm type dwellings. I'm going to go back to my uh, cheat guide here with the definitions. And the cheat guide does get into tips and tricks on the form. If you're trying to get help on how to fill out the E2VE form, a lot of the things I covered are bullet pointed out on this thing. So if you go to page two, three, and four of this document, it does go over a lot of the common things within the form, common errors, common things people make mistakes with. It's on, it tells you the most common styles that you could be using. Um, common things, things I've talked about are all things that were covered here. Okay. Um, this is going to conclude our E2VE valuations course. It's specific to Western Reserve Insurance Inspections. Um, again, if you have questions, don't be shy about reaching out to a manager or a trainer. There are help documents going to be attached to your ticket if you're doing Western Reserve, or there are some help documents within the library as well that cover residential valuations that could go a long way to help you with this as well. Thank you again for attending this webinar. We look forward to seeing you in a future session. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.